Hello, everyone. Welcome to another exciting week of our Mission Matters Twitter spaces. We host these once a week at 4 p.m. PST every Thursday. This week's dialogue is is if it's better to be a generalist or a specialist. And so we bring on all of our authors and podcasters to connect. And so for those of you that are just tuning in that I've heard or haven't heard of Mission Matters, for those of you, this is the first time hearing it, Mission Matters is a media platform really focused on the needs of entrepreneurs, executives, experts. We've been really positioned as a thought leadership platform, helping people share their story, whether it's in the means of books. So we have an entire book publishing department that specializes and helps others accomplish their missions, whatever that might be through a book format. And we also are able to do this through podcasts. So we have an entire podcast network, podcast agency side of our business. We published almost I I know it's over 250 authors. I think we're nearing 300 authors here soon. And we just recently released our Business Leaders Volume 8 book, which just came out and are in the process of promoting that. Through our podcast side, we have about 100, almost 200 podcasts for. And so something that we've been doing pretty consistently and frequently. So with that, you know, we basically put these events together every week. And what we're going to do is coordinate some intros. And so I'm going to hand it off here to my co-host, Adam, and he'll facilitate some introductions for everyone. All right. Thank you, Shirag, for putting this together and choosing the topic and getting everyone going. So a lot of friendly faces here I've seen. Some I'm seeing for the first time and excited to connect. Some are on the schedule and we have meetings and interviews coming up. So excited to get everybody involved and together here. So Joanna, nice to see you. We'll start with you, please. Hey there, Joanna Pineda, CEO and Chief Troublemaker at Matrix Group. So we're a digital agency And we help mostly associations and nonprofits increase their membership and generate revenue. And we do it through web, mobile, social, and virtual events. Thank you. So good to see you. Mayank, welcome, welcome. Hey, thanks, Adam. I'm hoping everybody can hear me okay. Guys, my name is Mayank. I'm a director of strategy at a company called Accenture. Specialize in a lot of areas, but my focus areas are innovation, 5G, smart home, and metaverse. Thank you. Lakeisha, so good to see you. Thank you, Adam. This is Lakeisha Mazur, Business Development Advisor for Legal Help, number 4 bizcom where I'm helping business owners use a lawyer in their business daily. And since it's October, cybersecurity, well, protecting small business from data breaches and cyber attacks. Thank you. Phil, welcome. Hey, this is Phil, the Think Director with Solomon, and we work primarily really target-focused on helping people on probation and parole do the crime, do the time, pay the fine, the last time, the last time, build a new life, build a new mission. We also work with folks building their mission, their life mission. So, you know, older, older folks in the later part of life, and then people who are struggling through pieces of life to build that life mission get focused and go forward. Awesome. Thank you, Phil. Catherine, welcome. I I just followed you, I believe, for the first time. So welcome. And everybody else, don't forget to follow Catherine if you didn't get a chance yet. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, guys. Yep, I'm new to this group here. I'm the vice president of marketing and PR for a company called Solo Secure. We're actually in the startup space. We're twofold. We have a hardware side to us. So we develop biometric ignited safety and security tools like a pepper spray that only works with your fingerprint and can't be used against you, things like that. And then we have a our SaaS platform is a personal safety and security app that runs on predictive analytics. So that's me and my space. Nice to meet you guys. Thank you, Annette. So good to see you. Welcome. Hi there. Thank you. My name is Annette Sellers. I am a retailer in Chicago. I own three retail shops. One is I Want, which is an eyewear shop, Apothecary that fits healthwear for people that have cancer and diabetes, and Iporium is a fine art gallery. Thank you. Jackie, good to see you. Ah, oh, nice to see you all. My name is Jackie Lee. I am the CEO of Silver Screen Printing. We are a high volume direct to retail textile manufacturer and decorator in uh, the upper Midwest. Thank you, Jeff, our fearless leader of publishing. Oh, I think actually, I think Jeff was going to be not in a good reception area. So we'll keep on going. Denley, welcome. Denley, maybe you opted out of speaking. I don't know. I see you as a I'm listener. I'm happy. There. I'm and, happy. Uh, I'm happy, and I'm oh. here today, and super grateful that to see all of my, geez, all of my beloved authors here. 
makes me so excited. Jeff Norskog, Director of Publishing at Mission Matters. Yeah, I'm excited for this topic. I'm excited for all of us to get together. This is when I'm meeting on a daily basis, meeting and talking to prospective authors. This is like the fact that I get to show up every week and see everybody chopping it up and sharing a story and busy. When I hear Phil talking about being out, you know, doing five hour conferences and sharing his vision and bringing attention to what he's doing, it just, uh, it's the cherry on top. I'm just excited to be here and look forward to sharing. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. Denley Lakshman, if you decide that you want to be a speaker, just request it. But if you'd like to listen, no problem there as well. Welcome to Rosemary. I believe typically you like you're a speaker. Just wanted to, we're doing the intros. If you'd like to come up, I think you just request it and we'll add you. But if I don't see that request, then let's just move on. But again, welcome if, you, if you'd like to come up and speak Rosemary as well. All right. So let's just get it kicked off. So is it just to throw this out there too, this is not a podcast interview interview or an interview. This is all of us. Everybody can ask questions. Everybody interacts. Again, a round table. We're all around our virtual dinner table, as Shirag mentioned. Is it better to be a generalist or a specialist? Let's just start off by uh, opening up the floor. Can I make one more request? I'd love Denley and, and Lakshman. Can you guys, I would, I would love to get you involved in this conversation. I know you got some ideas. So come on up as speakers if you can. Thank you. That's the way to do it, Jeff. I agree. All right. Let, let's open up the floor, though. <laughs> Is it better to be a generalist or a specialist? Let's just open it up. Who wants to dive in there and tackle that one first? I'll dive in. This is Lakeisha. Yeah, thank and, you, Lakeisha. Uh... Don't be scared. I love it. This is Adam, <laughs> this is Adam and I'm going to say thank you. Don't be scared. <laughs> She'll get it going. <laughs> All right. So from the assessment, most people actually start off as a generalist, meaning when they choose their industry. Now, after you choose your industry, you do find that there is a woo factor that you need to consider. And what I mean by woo factor is woo is actually an acronym, which means wheel of opportunity. So say you have a hairdresser. Yes, he or she does hair, but to specialize it out, you would have a hairdresser that would specialize in thinning hair. If you had a person that was a balloon artist, they have the option of specializing in like certain creations. So say someone, all they did was quinceañeras, you know, that would be their will of opportunity. And like for myself, when I first got started in the insurance agency, they call them market segments because I was, I was corporate. So they had like, you know, you had final expense, which is a certain age bracket. Then you have mortgage protection, which is a, a certain bracket. And even when you chose that part of the wheel of opportunity, there was even more niched down. And depending how you choose your wheel of opportunity, that does determine how you're going to create your customer avatar and do your and, and plan your marketing around that. This is Annette, and I would fully agree with that. When you begin into your career and becoming an entrepreneur, you're certainly a generalist. And once you find the avenue which you're going to follow, you then become a specialist. And it is definitely better to be a specialist. And the reason why you just previously said that you have an insurance company. And if we look at it from a healthcare perspective, we have, you know, most people have PPOs with their insurance and that enables you to go directly to the specialist and the doctor of your choice versus going through internal medicine, going through, you know, each department until you end up with the specialist that's actually going to fix what you need to have done. So once you find it, then you specialize in it and then you expand on that, but you have to keep the driving force going in the correct same direction so that you can actually be that specialist. Some people think they're specialists and they're really not because they haven't found the right thing and they don't stay on that same path all the way through. And a lot of entrepreneurs are kind of all over the place. They want to design everything. They want to invent everything. And they just simply think that they can do it all when they certainly cannot. And they need other people to drive them and help them to find that specialty. Yeah, I would agree with that. This is Catherine. It's interesting because, you know, in my space right now, I'm hiring a graphic designer and a web developer. And I'm talking to a couple of people who are grouping a lot of different specialties into one thing. In fact, I made the mistake of hiring somebody who was suggesting they could do, you know, like four to five different things. So really a generalist, not a specialist. And the reality is, is that like Gary B said, I remember listening to a podcast with him and he's like, find one thing that you do and do it really, really well. 
And because when you, when you start stacking it and you start, you know, building an organization and everybody's got their hands in so many different things, but nobody's really good at one thing or anything. They're just generalized. You really can't get the quality that you need. So I think definitely, I mean, I think you're going to find a lot of generalists at a high level running organizations, but yeah, at the tactical level and you know, how the, you're running the back of your business on these people that really need to know what they're doing for each of those specialties, I think is really important. Yeah, this is my from Accenture and I kind of agree and being in smaller companies you know having founded my company before and now in a bigger size company I think being a specialist matters sometimes because you know nowadays people don't have a long attention span anyway so you got you need to be known for something you do and if you do a lot of things you know it just uh, dilutes your value in general and talk to people and it's not that you don't know anything you know a lot of things it's just that it, it gets diluted in, in the world and if you are known for one thing, like Gary Vee is known for that, that one thing that he does really well, that's how people remember him, right? So in all these years, I've seen that when people shine with that one or two things, it, it's much more effective than they know multiple things because then they can't focus on one and get the best quality out. This is Phil. I'm going to jump in and talk about life mission matters, right? I remember getting a call once from somebody I hadn't worked with for 17 years. And he called me up and he said, are you still the same guy? And immediately I went to, well, how does he know me? He knew me as a fixer, as a fixer. I, I help fix people's lives now, get them focused on life mission. But back then I was fixing departments and I, I could make that portable between industries, whether it was healthcare or insurance or retail or nonprofit, but specialized in fixing, getting things focused to the mission, the goal, getting it organized. And sometimes I don't think we figure out who we are until we've spent time doing different things. So we might try four or five different things as a generalist, and then we begin to figure out, hey, this is what I'm really good at. This is what I want to specialize at. So what, what do people think about that? This is Jackie from Silva. I have always considered myself a professional generalist in the fact that I'm defining it a little bit differently than you guys have. So I think this is really interesting, but I, I say that in the fact that in any given day, my skill set could be used in a hundred different directions because part of dealing in manufacturing is, you know, immediately being able to put out fires or immediately being able to solve problems. And you can only do that if you've got a broad idea or a general perspective on what is going to give you multiple different solutions or outcomes to those problems. I also think that I like to keep my options nimble in the fact that sometimes if I follow a path of a very specialized solution, I may not think outside the box. So I try and be a uh, pretty universal in my initial assessment with things using the generalist skills that I have from years of being in business and applying them differently to every problem or potential pitfall in front of me. I also think that's important for our team to be able to stay nimble so that we have the flexibility to move people around. If we had somebody that was just a press operator and that was their specialized skill, the day that they're out, then we have a gap in that placement. So for us, there's a more value position to be a little more generally trained in an overall skills within our market. I also think that those transferable skills make people more valuable as employees from the perspective of a skill set, if that makes sense. Hey, it's so Jeff Norscott. Yeah, I think that I'd have to agree with you, Jackie. I agree with a lot of the sentiment I've heard so far. And I think it's in some cases, it has to be a hybrid. And in some cases, you know, in these startup entrepreneurial companies we find ourselves in, sometimes we have to wear multiple hats. But I think Catherine said it, you know, as you age, you know, as you start to get a little more mature in your career cycle, which is probably where I find myself, I have to be, yeah, kind of the, I have to be a specialized generalist. So I have to know enough about what everybody's doing so that I can help manage their output, their productivity, but also generalized enough so that I can, you know, steer the entire ship. So it's a little bit of a, you know, I think, I think you have to have, you have to be nimble. I think, especially in the entrepreneurial world, if you don't, you know, if you don't know your way around a contract and you can't, you know, jump in and be business affairs on some day, or you can't jump in and, you know, kind of maybe not throttle the creative, but at least, you know, manage it. I think you're at a disadvantage, but I think that's the role of the operator is to be more generalized 
And I've looked back on my career and I often wish I'd been more specialized, but my interests are so broad. Like I've had a lot more fun learning Adam's job in the last year than I have like perfecting mine. And I think that's just being curious. And I don't know, sometimes maybe it doesn't scale well, but you know, I think there's a handful of us who are still trying to figure out what we really are going to be when we grow up. And we realize that, you know, all of the individual skills lead to grow towards something. But yes, at its core, you need specialists. I need someone, if I'm developing an app, I need someone who, who understands code. If I'm doing graphic design, I, I need somebody who's specialized. So I think it's figuring out where you need to lean into the specialization and where having kind of general managers is effective. Hey, Jeff, this is Joanna. I'm wondering if you are pointing to something that basically says, if you're a builder, <clears throat> you better be specialized so that you can do the job really well. But if you're a manager type, you need to be more of a generalist so that you can kind of manage the different things that people do. I'm also hearing that maybe when you're early in your career, you should be a specialist, but the higher you are in the organization, but I think by just virtue of time and tenure, you end up learning a lot about a lot of different things. So you become a generalist. I don't know if I'm on the side of generalist or specialist, but I'll tell you a couple of things that happens in my business. So I hire developers, right? And if someone says I'm a C-sharp developer and they're so specialized, they're actually not as valuable as someone who says I'm a developer. Because what happens is almost every three years, my tech stack changes. And here's the rub, at least at my company. When the tech stack changes, you have to be able to focus deeply. And I'm sure I'm going to recommend another book, Deep Work by you know Cal Newport. You have to like be able to focus really deeply to get good enough at that new thing and then reinvent yourself three years later. So I don't know if that makes you a generalist or a specialist who's got flexibility. So I think about like, I had this one guy who said, look, I'm a cold fusion developer and that's really all I want to do. I'm a specialist. At, at some point I couldn't use him anymore because that's all he could do. He was a one trick pony versus the person who said I was cold fusion but now there's this new thing. So I want to be C sharp and then says, wow, you know what? Now the thing is Python and Vue or, you know, Vue.js. I'm going to kind of pivot. But at my core, I'm a developer. I, I don't know if that's generalist or specialist, but that's what I see in my business. I think that brings uh, This is Annette. It, and what I would I say to that is that if you know, it basically gets down to whether you are a boss or a leader. A boss is going to stand there and nip at you about everything you should be doing. Go and mop the floor and do this and then do that. But I think that entrepreneurs are people that are leaders by teaching and hoping that with what you're teaching, they're going to follow suit. And the analogy that I use for that is I had an employee who was a viola teacher of high school students. And, you know, he said, well, and Eddie, are, are, you're my boss. And I said, well, you know, actually, I'm not your boss. It's just like you, you know, you don't boss your student to play viola better than you do. Uh, you teach them so that they follow suit in what you do. And I think that that is very important to determine which you are as an entrepreneur when you're going into the business that you're in and whether or not you want to uh, lead the masses that are going to be working with you to carry what you are doing and the platform you're giving them into the future of being successful, whether you're general or special. I think it's, this is Rosemary. I, I'm listening and I, I'm fascinated by the conversation. Where I'm coming out here is that when we're talking about entrepreneurs and startups and, you know, relative, relatively young businesses, like under five years, I think that you, the entrepreneur who starts or the group of partners who start, are all needing to, they know where they want to go and they are putting their talents and skills and experience together. And it becomes a both end, whether, they, you know, they may have a particular expertise, but as someone said, you know, if you just focus on your expertise, then you're not really allowing yourself to be influenced by somebody else's expertise that might trigger something that's totally different, you know, a new creation. 
So I think that with when you're when you're in an entrepreneurial phase, I think it's you know you have to be open to a generalist, but you also need work done. You need specific tasks that are going to be done. Not everybody can be doing the same thing because you'll be you know running around in circles. So it's I mean that's the artistry that I believe comes with a a good manager who knows what has to be done and when it has to be done and how it might be done and can assign that task. So you need people that can really pick up the ball. And if they don't know how to do something, they at least know where to get some information or will come back to the individual in charge to get some direction setting. I think when you when you look at larger corporations, that issue becomes a little different because it's the distinction between an organizational focus, which is the generalist, and, you know, the function functional focus, which are your special specialists. And I know in my business, which is consulting and executive coaching, someone said it before that they don't know what their, their purpose in life is, that they seem to be just moving along, but haven't gone deeply to think about, you know, what's important to them, what their values are. And I think as you get higher up in the organization, that becomes really very important. I think the, the problem, if I look at medicine now, the problem is that you have so many specialists and whenever you go to a specialist, all they look at is their special. No one is looking at the whole body. And I think it's a, I think it becomes a real problem because something as simple as a reaction to a medication that you might be taking for your heart might be affecting your kidney and the kidney specialist that you're you're going to doesn't even know that i mean you know so it, i think the degree of specialization has created a lot more a lot a lot more complexity and i'm not sure that it's really solving the world's problem well that's where you have to manage yourself yes. you have to be able to know your own body and your conditions that's, well enough that you are able to navigate that healthcare system and know yourself whether or not there's going to be a drug that's interfering with a different disease that you may have. Mm -hmm. People well, you really have to be, to your be own educating advocate. themselves more and becoming their their own managers and their own advocates. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're having to do with PPOs. Yeah. But I had a thought about this. So like, I'm not sure that I want a generalist if I've got a medical problem. I actually want the best person, you know, if it's a foot problem or whatever. And I think what you were talking about is when the, when the kind of the answer isn't cut and dry, you're probably better off having a team of people, which is apparently what they're doing in places like Cleveland Clinic, so mm -hmm. that you have kind of the best thinking around the patient and less about the disease. But I just had a thought. So I guess kind of going into this conversation, I actually said just a few minutes ago that when you're a builder, you're more of a specialist, but maybe when you're a manager, you're more of a generalist and the higher up you go, you're more of a generalist. But now I'm kind of rethinking this based on this conversation. I'm wondering if maybe when I was younger, I was a really good proposal writer and that was my specialty area. And then I became kind of a specialist in fundraising. And then I became a specialist in nonprofit marketing. And now I'm doing other stuff. But is maybe my specialty just different? So like I have a woman who was a terrific developer, moved up, and now she's terrific project management. And that's her new specialty. So maybe they're all specialists. I'm kind of rethinking this. And what makes them really good is they've changed their specialty focus. And it looks like they're generalists. But like, I'm thinking about this woman, woman in particular, as a project manager, she's a specialist at knowing the intricacies of the project, knowing the dependencies and knowing how to communicate the complexities. So this is Phil. You know, sometimes I think we have transferable specialties and we discover things that we're really good at that we never knew. I use a phrase called play to your strength, cover your weaknesses. When you're an executive or you're on a team, you got to know what your strengths are, what your specialties are, and then what the rest of the team is and how to merge that together. That's part of being a leader, a leader specialist. That leadership is a specialty in and of itself. But if you're going to be a really focused specialist, you have got to have a team around you to fill in the gaps of where you're not. You really have to have those partners in the process that fill in the gap where you're not. I've got a person who works with me. I think somebody mentioned they 
picked up a book off of a, a TikTok video we just did recently. Well, I have a marketing specialist who's super at social media, and I just let her run the game and tell me what to do. But I know what I need to say. My specialty is communicating. Her specialty is getting it across to the right audience. This is Lakeisha. I would definitely say you definitely need a team. And together, you're a great team. And even with being a specialized generalist, which is still good, in leadership, you still need to know when you need to delegate. And when you get yourself out the way to delegate those weaknesses, you can then work with the people that have the strengths. One of the things I decided was when I when I grew my business was I need to be a business development advisor because I didn't like the word consultant, but advisor was on point because I noticed when I was doing all the networking meetings, sometimes there would be another me in the room and they were a quote, quote, specialist. So I was like, well, I don't want to be the insurance agent and I don't want to be the legal plan advisor and I don't want to be the this and the that. But dependent on who I'm working with, I'm best utilized at how that client needs me to be utilized. So even if they call and go, hey, you're my health insurance agent. Well, at that point, yes, I'm going to be your health insurance agent. You know, if, oh, you're the life insurance lady. At that point, yes, I'm going to be the life insurance lady. But overall, and for marketing purposes versus putting my license on everything, especially working in different states, I just found like I know my core, but I also knew what my weaknesses were and got myself out the way for delegation to have a team, which I am so thankful for because it makes stuff a lot easier. I think this is Catherine. I think it's an interesting topic, but the other thing I think is worth exploring you guys are talking and I'm thinking about this is we've talked a lot about evolving your specialty, Hello? what you're focused in. How do you guys look at continuing education? I mean, in my space, like I'm in marketing and okay, so- Okay, I've lost contact. This is Annette. Can you guys hear Annette? And I can hear you. Okay, there you are. Okay, you're back again. Okay, yes, I would add to that, you know, when you find your path and you go down that path and you're an entrepreneur and you start your business and you become the specialist. And I think that as you age and you start to have your interests in other businesses and whether you shift to them or not, you then become more of a generalist in that you already know how the business model works and how it should work and how you can teach and lead people. And that would be the most important thing that, you know, as you even transition back into being a generalist, you're then able to teach other people the way that and lead them the way that you see that they need to go to be able to find their specialty. And I think it's super important for people as they age in the many different businesses that they have over a career that they are able to teach and lead the younger people. I know nothing about social media. So of course, I'm going to hire someone that does just that. And they're a specialist in that. And I think that we're all just kind of general managers of the businesses that we create and putting people in the positions of what they're able to specialize in. And that's really the only way that you can grow your business is having other specialists, other specialties doing what they do to elevate you as a whole to the next level and, and hopefully continue on to the next specialty just from being a generalist so that I think that everyone is, is both and particularly entrepreneurs are both. Yeah, Catherine, good, to good, answer your good. question, yeah. I did want to say that continuing education, depending on if you're licensed or if you're a specialist, someone else is important. So yeah, for being a, an agent, CE credits, absolutely, Catherine. Yeah, I mean, I just think it's interesting in like trying to, you know, this, the world post COVID is very different. And so even as I'm trying to work with my marketing team and talking about the different um, channels, like look at the rise of TikTok. I hear nothing. And look at how it's so different from all of the other marketing channels that are out there. And you have to complete, and this, the rise of TikTok has really been impacted since COVID, right? So you have all these people using much more authentic way of appearing to your audience, right? So it's a whole different ball game of how they're doing it. But there's no like, it's just interesting to see like, well, where are people going to learn like, okay, what, you know, how are you making sure that, okay, if you're running a business and you're technically, you know, a specialist in some areas, but having to be a generalist because you're overseeing all these things, like, how do you make sure you're ensuring that your finger is still on the pulse and that you still understand all of the moving parts? Like, I just find it to be a little overwhelming. I'm always like, I don't even know where, you know, sometimes it's like, 
I go to YouTube and I'm like, okay, well there, I've learned a lot of new and innovative things that are going on right now. But, you know, we obviously have to ma make sure that we're still maintaining, you know, an educational aspect to it. So I was just curious to see how other people were approaching that. It's Jeff, you know, I think this is a really, really important point because the, you know, whatever segment of the business you're talking about, things are so dynamic anymore. You know, there's just, there's new platforms, there's new tech, there's new approaches. There's just so many different tools. And if you don't, it feels like there's, you know, I think Joanna, Joanna alluded to it, you know, especially in, in the tech space, it feels to me like training, ongoing education is going to become more and more important, whether that's, you know, formalized education or, you know, within the within the organization it's just going to be so key and i think some of us have talked about this offline you know i think even from a managerial perspective i've gotten to this place where i i have to to lean into the technology you know i have to be on the new platforms i have to like i have to be able to have a, a smart dialogue with my 10 year old about roblox i need to understand the world we live in because it affects you know all of the strategic decisions and that's where the training it, you're so right it's like two weeks later something shifted and you're trying to make marketing you know digital marketing decisions and and you don't feel like you have all of the data to kind of lean into it so i think education training I think it's going to become more vital. I think for, for even for top management, it's crucial and probably, you know, is going to continue to scale that way. I think to piggyback on that, this is Jackie from Silva. I like what Catherine mentioned with the continuing education. I think that from the entrepreneurial perspective that I have, I went into a business that I both had an interest in and I felt like I could excel at. And people have changed companies or jobs or businesses or companies or whatever they need throughout the growth of their, you know, employment cycle. But I did the path that I took specifically so that I had the flexibility to learn other things that I found interesting. Some of those overlap professionally and some of them don't. But if you don't have the uh, willingness to have a broad view or you know a global perspective, then then I think that the path of specializing, you know, knowing more and more about less and less it is a very viable path. I think if you have a wider view, then I think you almost have to be a more generalist in your view of both the world and education and your skill set and where you want to be known in the world. You know, there are people that are genuinely smart and accomplished and don't do one specific thing. And then there are these remarkable, you know, oncology specialists who only focus in one very specific thing. And I think those are two completely divergent paths and each have their merit and value in the world. I don't think we get to where we are as entrepreneurs without first self-identifying which of those resonates with us. And they both have value depending on how you choose to follow your path through life. So this is just, this is Phil. Maybe we're talking about there's there's asynchronous channels of expertise within that specialty. That specialty is not so narrow that you can't branch out and you have to keep discovering those and those keep changing. What was good 10 years ago inside of, of management organization inside of marketing, boy, take marketing. What was good 10 years ago is is different today. So you have to constantly be changing and studying within your specialty these new asynchronous channels of expertise that keep you being the specialist that you've been. Okay, I have a question. I just got to know, what is asynchronous? Well, well, view it as, as you have multiple lines or multiple channels that are feeding into your specialty. You need to be working on each of those channels and you need to, I think you need to be open to create new channels. Maybe you're a great marketer, but you're a great direct media marketer, or maybe you're a great multi-channel marketer, or maybe you're a great social media marketer. But if you're going to be a great marketer and that's your specialty, you're going to have to learn all of those different channels and keep learning how they change in order to stay a specialist. Otherwise, you're you're going to be behind, and somebody's doing open heart surgery, and you're still trying to figure out how to cut and get to the heart. Right? You've got to keep learning to stay a specialist and be open to new channels of expertise within your specialty that maybe you've never done before. This is thank you, Phil, for elaborating on that better. 
this is Adam, and I got a question. So how does culture play a role in this in, in terms of ranking? And I'll tell you where I'm going with this. So, you know, when I was in, let's just say when I was in finance, I would have 100%, like, specialist is all I want. If I got an asset manager that I'm hiring for a client and I need them to specialize in one part of the portfolio, like, that's all I want from them. That's what I'm getting. But now, you know, being in media and with what we do at Mission Matters, I find myself kind of leaning more towards culture. Like if somebody fits into whether it's a vendor that we're hiring or whether it's somebody that we're hiring internally or whether even if it's a client that we want to work with and publish or start a show for them, like I'm leaning more towards culture versus generalist or specialist mm -hmm. because I'll just give you one example. Let's just think about, you know, running a Facebook ad campaign for a client or something else. You wake up one day and Facebook changed everything at the you know snap of a fingers and you thought you specialized and knew everything about it and then they change everything. Like we don't own the Facebook platform. Doesn't matter what we think about that. We even have to relearn things that we thought we knew. So with everything moving so fast and the pace at which we're talking with each other, I find it hard or connecting with each other on different platforms, social media or otherwise, or just communication. I, when I would even think that I was a specialist in media because we've done quite a bit of work there and, you know, have a certain amount of reach there, things change and you're like, oh, wait a minute, I didn't know that. Okay, that's a new thing. That's a new platform. That's a new, we got to learn TikTok. We got to learn whatever the next social media platform is that's going to come out because that's our business right so again circling back to the question where does where does culture or how does culture play a role in this discussion of generalists or specialists and where do people rank it this is jackie i'm going to answer that in kind of a brief moment here because i don't think it's so much culture i think it's more network i think in this world now where you had more people that were farther apart and we have now even through just this mission matters thing become a network of peers where i am now able to connect with people who have this specialty that i don't know and a very easy way to do it it gives me a comfort level to do business differently because i now have a wide range of peer-reviewed levels of professionals that just were not accessible to me before. And that's that's because you guys are good at what you're doing and connecting us all. So this, Phil, let me ask you a question, Adam. Are you talking about culture within the culture of your organization, the culture of how you do work and, and how you partner with other people? Or are you talking about culture in general, what's going out there, the culture that you're trying to target market into? I'm talking about in general, because I used to have an opinion versus generalists or specialists, and now I don't quite as much, and I'm more so leading with culture. Like, are they a right fit? Whether, again, it's somebody you want to work with, somebody you want to hire, but in general, like I'm finding that the ranking of where I put generalists or specialists Assuming it's not something like, for example, what, you know, Joanna said earlier, like you need a programmer to do one specific thing. That's different. But I mean, in general. So maybe but, what uh, you're saying is character and chemistry count more than competency. You can build competency, but character and chemistry are, have got to be there. You always got to have all this alliteration on me, Phil. Thank you. Say that again. <laughs> I think character and chemistry count sometimes more than competency. There might be a, a generalist in a competent manner. But if you can get the right character and the right chemistry, they can become a specialist for you and what you're trying to do. Hey, it's Jeff. I think what, what Jackie, I think what you said is spot on. And I agree with that, Phil. I think, you know, I, I don't usually go to the sports analogies, but, I, you know, when you look at sports teams, it's a good way to look at organizations. So you need balance, right? So mm -hmm. every sports team has very specialized, you know, pitchers, let's say a baseball team, right? There's mm -hmm. a very a lot of specialized positions that are really important to success. And then you've got, you have to have a good balance of generalized people who can fill in at any position. And then you have to have obviously coaching, leadership, management, and you've got kind of from A to Z of super generalized to super specialized. And then what you also have, if you look at professional sports, you then have a culture, right? And they have a culture and some cultures mm -hmm. are about winning and they don't necessarily focus on players that are specialized or generalized. They focus on people that fit in their culture and they breed respect and they breed winning and they kind of figure it out on the back end. And I think those are kind of all of the variables that when I look at putting together an organization, 
I need like a balance between all of those. And when you get it right, it really works synchronicity, right? You know, you really get the flow. And when you don't, and I think that's what Adam was leading to, when you just focus on, you know, maybe one or two of the variables, you may get a very competent team, but they may not work well together or fit with each other. Well, they, and this is Rosemary. They may not get the results that are desired. Exactly. Somebody mentioned earlier, I don't remember if it was, was talk, maybe it was Joanna, talking about development skills. So you got somebody who's a C-sharp and somebody else who's a Python and somebody else old mainframe code, IBM code or something. But you need developers who've got good character and chemistry who can learn new competencies. And that that's mm -hmm. really important. I mean, if, if the character and the chemistry is off, if the culture is off, no matter how great their skill is, it's just not going to get where it needs to go. It's interesting because the world we're in now is there's so much uncertainty. And, and, you know, I think about all these young people coming, you know, graduating from colleges and, you know, how, where are they going and what are they, what are they, what kinds of roles are they looking for and how are they going to continually learn? Because the continuous learning is the norm now. I mean, you have to keep yourself up to date, no matter what field you're in, but also you need to have a level of curiosity outside of your field so that, you know, kind of continually, in a sense, refreshing your mind as to what's going on. And it's, it's, and it's the increase in information is so rapid now. So I often wonder, like, what, you know, what is going to happen to, to people? Because you also have to, you have to think about the individual as a person. And you have all of these, you have children all over the country now who are suffering from anxiety, which, and they're on drugs, which to me is, you know, I, I get really very upset about that because, you know, I, I kind of feel, well, okay, it's the pharmaceutical industry that once again is solving a symptom, not addressing the core problem. But I just, you know, I, I basically agree that this contrast between generalist and specialist may be an old paradigm. And maybe we need to think about what would be the new paradigm. And I think the importance of somebody fitting on the team you know, having integrity, character, as well as competency and, and their ability to work together for a common goal rather than for their individualized goal would be very important. This is Annette. And again, that goes right back to being a, a boss or a leader. And what's happening with people that are going to college now is that they're spending all of this money to go to college and they're getting out and there's no jobs for them. So ultimately, we're going to end up with a less educated society. Well, I think we've been going there for a long time myself. I, I call it the dumbing down of the American work, but it's unfortunate. It's very, very unfortunate. It's, it saddens me. I don't think it's necessarily, uh, this is Jackie, I don't think it's necessarily a, a dumbing down. I think it's different priorities and a different learning process. The new generation has a, a different skill set than I did when I was in college, you know, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's very, very different. And the expectation level has to be that they will be adaptive to what is available in their market, much like we were adaptive to what was available in our market. There are people that will always succeed and there are people that will always struggle. And um, the, the goal is to, I think, take the idea of this generalist transferable skill set and help people understand that it can be applied even to a wide range of jobs if you've got a basic core competency and understanding of interpersonal interactions, how to problem solve, how to get beyond hurdles, how to think outside yourself, just some very key, you know, business savvy ways of doing things from a general perspective, give you a lot of transferable skills that allow you to succeed in a wide range of business settings. And then if you choose to take a very specialist path, you have that option. But I, those are readily available for people that are willing to do it. It's just how 
we communicate that availability to the new markets. This is Adam, and I want to definitely give everybody, we normally keep these to about an hour, but I want to like do a last, like we'll go around. And I think, I think, by the way, Rosemary and Jackie, I think that you're both spurring like something that could be a whole nother topic for us to talk about. So I'm not trying to cut that end short where we're going. But I do want to, I do, we're heading up to the top of the hour though. So I do want to just kind of go around and let everybody else or let everybody yourselves included get a chance for maybe any final words of wisdom or thoughts or anything else before we cut it for today. And don't worry, we'll be back next week, same time. And I'll do the, we'll do the formal intro. So if anybody like to chime in. This is Catherine. Yeah, I got to pop good. off for a five o'clock meeting. So I just want to say it was really nice chatting with you guys and look forward to the next one. Thank you, Catherine. All Thanks, right. Catherine. All right. Thank you. This Thanks. is Lakeisha. I just say the expression of jack of all trades and master of none can actually be turned on its head. Mic drop. Thank you, Lakeisha. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? No, I think I like the analogy of, you know, continuous learning and be curious. Uh, I kind of agree with that. As much as possible, we all want to be specialized into one or two things. The world is changing so fast that it's inevitable that we have to learn new things quickly than before. So, yeah, there's a gray area somewhere there, but, you know, keep the options open, but keep your specializations also ready to go. Anyone else? Any final words of wisdom or thoughts? And it really doesn't matter which you are. You can find yourself in burnout in either. So the real trick is trying to keep it fresh regardless right. of what you do and being able to transition and chameleon into something else if you reach that point. This is Rosemary. I've really enjoyed the conversation and I think the importance of learning how to listen will become increasingly critical as we move forward because what I'm noticing here on the East Coast in New York is that People are just using their devices and they're creating re rapport and relationship with their devices, not with other people. So that people don't even look one another in the eye. And so when we talk about developing a team and now that people are working, you know, oftentimes remotely and not being in the, the same workplace, even like a day a week, I think that becomes a very serious issue. So I, I would love for you guys to consider that for another topic. Shirag, you got that? We're in. I'm in for that for a topic. We'll definitely have Shirag do some programming on that. And any other last ones? L last call? No. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, I, I just want to thank everyone for coming out and for showing up for this. It means a lot. Great to have all our authors on here and members of our community giving their, their opinions, their insights, and uh, leveraging their talent for the benefit of others. That being said, we will be here again next Thursday, 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, love to welcome the, the listeners that are out there. Come back, show up, listen again. Uh, the speakers, definitely love to have you back. We'll have some new topics. And for now, until next week, thank you everyone for coming. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.